Well, uh, let's get started. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here today. Um, we are in our third webinar for Pinot Month. If you've missed the prior two, they are recorded on avwines.com forward slash learn. Uh, this one will also live there. Um, it'll probably be up tomorrow on Friday. We'll email out the replay as well. Um, we want to say thank you again to Zachy's DC who helped um, distribute the packs nationally. So if you didn't get wine for this webinar or any of them, those packs are still available with free shipping. And um, also to Corvin, um, for those of you that have this device, um, we did send some out um, and uh, it's a great tool to help you explore wine. So thank you to Corvin as well. Um, this webinar series is uh, really a great way for us all to learn together uh, and discover Anderson Valley Pinot Noir. And this webinar is really cool um, for those of you that do have the wine um, because you're gonna be doing some deductive reasoning and learning about the Pinot Noir um, from the deep end area of Anderson Valley um, through tasting and through an interactive um, uh, exercise that we're gonna be doing. Um, and, and we think this is really cool. There's a group that formed here in Anderson Valley a couple of years ago, um, which includes a couple dozen winemakers, I think maybe up to 40. Um, that are actively getting together throughout the year and tasting wine and sharing unfinished wines. Um, and they're exploring An um, Anderson Valley Pinot Noir and trying to see what the different characteristics are around the valley, um, whether it's, you know, Ridgetop, Deep End, Boonville, Valley Floor, et cetera. So um, you're going to get to do a little bit of exploration um, like they're doing on an ongoing basis. For those of you that, um, are going to be joining us in the tasting exercise, um, you're gonna need to scan a QR code with your phone. So if you are on your phone and you wanna participate in that, you might wanna log on um, to the webinar real quick um, via a laptop or a desktop and then have your phone ready so you can participate. Um, very excited to have two Psalms here with us today. So we have uh, Master Psalm Nick Hetzel joining us from Las Vegas and um, our local, um, San Francisco sommelier, Peter Palmer, who's gonna take us through today's uh, webinar and activity. And we're really excited. So I'm going to pass that over to, uh, to Nick and have a great, great time. Thanks. Courtney. Awesome. Thank you, Courtney. Peter, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Peter's not just a local San Francisco sommelier. The dude's a, a legend, for those of you that don't know him, uh, in the Bay Area. So always thrilled to be working with him. And of course, always talking about Anderson Valley wines. I think uh, this is gonna be a super fun, engaging afternoon, evening, depending on where you are at, uh, to really kind of engage in the discussion about defining typicity, if we can define that. We're gonna touch more on that as well, but you know, considering that this is a sort of sommelier-ish tasting, um, exercise. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna break things down in the beginning for you as well, and then of course uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, actually, not towards the end, like right in the middle. Uh, we're gonna bring in our excellent winemakers who know all about the dirt and all about the terroir. Um, Noah uh, and Noah uh, from Reeve and Hartford. So uh, Peter, real quick. What, uh, what was your first like epiphany moment with Pinot Noir and what was your first one with Anderson Valley? First encounter with Anderson Valley Pinot, whether it be random trip up to the valley, uh, hungover, struggling on the drive. Uh, what is it that makes you tick with Pinot? Um, tell us about uh, it. Very, very good question. I love and, and I've told those story, these stories uh, multiple times. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank again for and, and for Nick and I, uh, the Anderson Valley Wine Growers Association, uh, echo what uh, Courtney said, we're, I know we're both thrilled and honored to be here. Uh, so thanks, uh, thank you uh, again. Uh, so I tell the story every, I mean, I've, I've been a uh, kind of a fine dining sommelier, not a, not a master sommelier, but a fine dining sommelier here in San Francisco for about 25 years. Uh, most of it with the Pacoletto organization. So Boulevard, Farallon, Water Bar, uh, I've done work at all, all those restaurants. Oh. Uh, but 
but I arrived, I arrived in San Francisco a long, long time ago and had my first kind of, I was a bartender and server and had my first kind of uh, Pinot Noir moment. Uh, at my 30th birthday, some friends of mine took me to uh, lunch at uh, South Park Cafe, if you, anybody remembers that from ages ago. And uh, my buddy ordered a bottle of 1988 Kent Rasmussen Pinot Noir from Carneros. And I stuck my nose in and I was freaking blown away. I was hooked. I had never smelled anything so effusive and so pretty and so uh, just explosive. I was hooked. So I've been a Pinot Noir fan ever since then. Uh, in 1999, I, I, I actually started a Pinot Noir, two-day Pinot Noir festival here in San Francisco. Uh, and back then there was not a whole lot going on for consumers or trade for Pinot Noir. Now it's a much different story. Uh, and then after that birthday celebration where I became hooked, uh, it wasn't maybe just a couple years later that I had my first bottle of Handley, of Handley sparkling wine and then uh, made my way up to the valley. And as soon as I saw the valley and started meeting the people and tasting more bubbles and Pinot Noir and just seeing the beauty of it, I was hooked and still am. Beautiful. Love that. You know, it's funny. I, my first uh, excitement with Pinot Noir as well came earlier in life than 30 for yourself, but was also Carneros, which is not a region I generally think of. I mean, nothing against Carneros, no. uh, not one I generally reach for every day. So that's awesome that you and I both had that same experience um, many, 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 many years ago. And, and since then have you know, uh, explored the rest of the world and, and the West Coast of the United States with this variety. So yeah. uh, as I had mentioned a little earlier, this is sort of a, a general run through on what we're gonna be discussing today. Again, uh, since you all are going to be participating in the survey, again, you know, organoleptically going through the wines and giving us your input so we can sort of attempt to come up with some level of typicity, uh, this is the deep end is what we have today. So this is what we're diving into. Those of you that have joined us for the previous um, webinars, you will know that this is a, a neighborhood that is quite important to the Anderson Valley. I think this tasting will be very eye-opening and either crushing our dreams for typicity or maybe being able to tie some things in um, regardless of style that might show a little sense of, sense of place. Um, and hopefully that's what we'll glean from today. So to start things off, let's go ahead. And for those of you that don't taste a lot or taste in a, a semi-formal setting, you're going to be asked some questions on the survey. And again, just to prime the survey, your, your name's not going to be listed. There's no right or wrong answers. We're looking for your opinions. We're looking for things that you're gleaning out of the wines. Um, so you will see a question about color. So Peter, uh, talk to us a little bit about this slide. I just want to make one quick note on that you will see on the survey a term called garnet that is more that sort of medium red but peter talk us uh, through this slide we have here and the difference this, uh, might find uh, th this slide I, I this slide I, I love this slide i love looking at uh different uh slides and pictures of the colors of wine i was uh i went to school at university of cincinnati for uh, fine arts majored in fine arts and i'm still i still draw and um, and make art to this day. So this has always been a, uh, an aspect of wine that I've found uh, pretty, beautiful, and it's some, some, sometimes compelling to look at the color uh, of a wine. I think uh, you can tell a lot from, even before you start tasting and, sm and, and smelling, you can tell a lot from the color uh, of a wine. You, of course, you can tell uh, about, you can tell, tell things about uh, how youthful it is, maybe how, uh, if it's an older wine, uh, you can certainly, looking at the color, you may not be able to tell what grape variety it is, but you might be able to tell what it's not. Uh, you know, if you look at a glass of Pinot Noir, you may not be able to tell blind, you may not be able to tell it's Pinot Noir, but you can probably eliminate things like Cabernet and Syrah and uh, uh, Merlot and, thing, and, th and things like that. Uh, and also, I like uh, uh, a lot can happen in the rim, I think, and Nick would, and the winemakers would know more about this than me, but those, that, that kind of, the color, uh, the secondary colors that it gets on the rim sometimes uh, broadcast kind of pink, which can tell you that it might be uh, kind of a lower pH, higher acid wine, or it might be like that blue purple, more extracted, which might tell you that it's maybe lower acid and richer and, and things like that. So I think it's fascinating. Plus it's just really romantic to look at the color. 
Absolutely, yeah. And, and again, I think when we're talking about our, can we define typicity, it's color something that really talks to us about typicity? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I think everyone's answers will kind of help us in that discussion later on. I think for me, if anything, outside of variety, it, it has a lot to do with winemaking and perhaps climate. So, excellent. Uh, let's move forward. Thank you. Oh, the old factory. <laughs> it's high school so, analogy. Those of you like me out there that struggle with seasons, this one uh, can be a little more difficult certain times of the year, but I think the general notion here is we want to smell and taste at the same time, as well as when you are tasting, you are actually smelling as there are receptors at the top of your esophagus um, that are interacting with your nasal cavity. Um, how about you, Peter? What do you do? How much focus do you put on when you're tasting uh, the nose versus the palate? A, 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 a lot. A lot of your, uh, a lot of the initial, of course, the initial uh, kind of experience experiencing the wine is going to be through the nose, but uh, mm. but you get a, you get a, you get a lot. I, I like to try and uh, you know not only smell initially, but after I've swallowed, kind of breathe out of breathe out of my nose to get some of those re residual, mm. uh, the taste of the wine back up to that kind of upper palate where it meets, you know, where there's that direct link uh, to your to your memory and to your to your brain. Uh, I think that, you can that tell fancy a lot term from, retronasal, absolutely. Retronasal, yeah. And I'm with you. I think a lot of us, this, when you first smell a wine, this is kind of where those, you know, visceral moments happen. Whoa this reminds me of X, Y, and Z, or wow, this is really powerful. Um, it's drawing me in, or ooh, I have to dig around a little bit for it. For it. Um, so everyone out there, when you, when you are taking the survey, you will notice we do not have like palate and nose broken up. It's sort of combined together for this exercise today. So just do your best. I mean, sometimes wines can smell different than they taste. They might smell Absolutely. really ripe and or vice versa, uh, more generally the other direction. Uh, but just do your best in working through it. Um, some other things you're gonna see, obviously we talk about some specific markers, if you will, or specific um, terms and things that might come about. This I think can help draw a conclusion for us best when we're determining these two wines from the deep end determining whether or not there are some similarities between the two. Because again, if you haven't tasted them already, there certainly are, there are differences. Um, so we want to draw some similarities. So again, these are common Pinot Noir uh, aromas and flavors, everything from earthiness to a wide spectrum of fruit. And I always think it's important when you're smelling and tasting wine to think about that fruit and its condition, right? Is this a, a, a strawberry you bought in the plastic from Costco, or is this well, kind of right now, farmer's market, Harry's berries, strawberry, that's like beautifully ripe and juicy and sweet, right? Think about those sorts of things as well, which can hide, kind of help you think about, okay, it's cooler climate, when are they harvesting, those sorts of things. Or uh, just to tag on to you what you just said, or is it strawberry that's been baked in a pie? You know, that, yeah, aroma, yeah, and that, yeah. that aroma and that and that expression of strawberry too. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So this is now you know, discuss this this notion. This is sort of the the overarching rhetorical question of the day. How does one define regional typicity? Uh, and, and I really am looking forward to discussing this with our winemakers uh, after we all go through the survey, because everybody I think has a little bit different idea behind that. And and I know you know with Peter and I discussing in some of our our you know pre calls to this is, you know, in general, California is a pretty young place in the world to grow grapes and to make wine from. Um, we're constantly evolving. We're constantly trying to find and define regional typicity. Again, I think having these two wines that are across the street from one another for all intents and purposes, right next to one another um, could be a glimpse into the fact that, you know, maybe we're not there yet. Or maybe there are a couple of things that we can take away from this and say, you know what, there is something very Anderson Valley about these. There is something very deep end about these. 
Um, and we'll just kind of see how it goes. This is, this is an open-ended question. This isn't a definitive, this is the typicity of X. You know, Noah's gonna have his certain things that he always finds in Kaiser Vineyard. Tion's gonna have things he always finds in Maggie Hawk Vineyard. Um, and hopefully you all out there can glean some great information as well. So. Um, yeah, I think if I can chime in real quick, I think as, please, a, please. as, as humans and as Americans, especially, especially we're, so, <laughs> we're so eager to, you know, to figure it out, to get there, to, you know, to get more specific, to answer all the questions and, and, and we're, we're, we're a young industry. We're a young wine loving and tasting and making culture. So that, I mean, that takes, a, that takes a long, long time. And also the past 20 years of Pinot Noir, it's, I mean, the movement and the, and the, and the changes that have happened have been just dr dramatic, dramatic. You know, when I opened restaurants 20 years ago, you know, Pinot Noir was a much, much different beast. Uh, both texturally and where it was, where, you know, where it was grown. We were talking about Carneros and, you know, a, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, Carneros was, you know, one of the it, one of the it childs of Pinot Noir. And so much has happened since then uh, with regions, with uh, understanding of place, all that kind of stuff. So it's, I mean, it's, we're in the, in the middle of a huge evolution. Well, I mean, yeah, and think about, I know we're sort of riffing here, but think about Anderson Valley. What was Anderson Valley 20 yep. years ago in terms yep. of, you know, wine? I mean, granted, one of my things that brought me to Anderson Valley Pinot was a, was a wine from the mid nineties uh, out of Anderson Valley, but it's, it's infantile really. And the same thing with Lamb Valley could be said and two really important, cool climate regions for these varieties. Um, so some other things to think about when discussing typicity of Pinot Noir. Okay. What, what is giving us typicity? Is it more these structural elements, acidity, tannin, right? Body, are those more important? Do those draw to that typicity more? Or is it things like aromas and flavors, fruit profiles? Um, there's this thing in the Anderson Valley called Pennyroyal. Is Pennyroyal prolific or noticeable in all wines from Anderson Valley? I don't know, hopefully we can kind of glean a little bit uh, today on that. Again, these are rhetorical open-ended questions. We just want you to be thinking about as we go throughout the rest of this presentation and certainly as you're tasting the wines, which will lead us to the meat of the presentation. I just tried both of the wines again and they are freaking delicious. They are delicious. So uh, we wanna do this. So it's gonna take a few minutes for us to gather all of your information. What's gonna happen here is you are going to scan the QR code with your camera on your phone. Now, for those of you that haven't been to a restaurant uh, post pandemic, it's a thing. <laughs> so scan it with your camera. You're going to click on the thing. It's going to pull up a form. You got to just hit some buttons and then hit submit. Um, and then that information will populate on our side and we will have all these fancy charts and graphs and things uh, where we can say, hey, look what everybody was saying about the read. Look what they were saying about the Hartford. So uh, we're going to leave this screen up for about the next eight minutes or so. I think once you get through the first one, the second one should go pretty quickly. Uh, so please, if you haven't already started, uh, those of you that have the wines, would you please uh, go ahead with the QR codes? And Peter, I'm going to run through them myself real quick, if that's okay. You can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'm going to talk amongst too. yourselves. I didn't even know I could do this with my camera until the other day. <laughs> It's so easy, yeah. Like I said, you're a legend, and, and that doesn't always mean that you're up to date on technology. <laughs> Talk to my friends, they'll tell you I'm a dinosaur. Oh, there's one of the uh, one of the little uh, descriptors that I kind of expect from uh, Anderson Valley. Doesn't happen all the time, but I oftentimes uh, get it in the Pinot Noirs up there. It's such a moving target. Pinot Noir to me, to a lot of people, is so uh, transparent and reflective of not only sight but of winemaking. I mean, it's it's easy to put your imprint on on Pinot Pinot Noir. 
uh, and either you know enhance what the site is saying or maybe uh, you know blur what the site is might be trying to say. I also kind of think that not all vineyards are really you know equal when it comes to broadcasting their their personality where they're, where they're from. They're still tasty wines, all of them, uh, but some are just like an actor. You know, some are better at projecting uh, where they where right. they come where they come from. Absolutely. Uh, Tion and Noah, I'd love to bring you guys on now as we have a little bit of time uh, while everybody's filling out their surveys or those that, that have the wines uh, available are filling out. And just kind of maybe get your initial impressions of or your thoughts on, on the deep end. Uh, we're going to get more into your specific vineyards, but I think uh, talking in general about the deep end and and your experiences, whether you've worked with vineyards outside of the deep end or in the deep end. Um, Tian, while you're unmuted there, I'm guessing the forklifts are down for a second. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, and this could just be visceral, like this could be you just driving out to the vineyard. What hits you um, about this special place? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, hey, yes, Jason. the forklifts are, are quiet right now. And uh, if they get loud, I'm sorry. If it's mid-sentence, I'll have to mute myself. And then you guys will have to make up the rest. <laughs> Finish my sentence for me. Uh, no, the Anderson Valley, it's interesting. You know, when I came here, I, I came from South Africa. And there, the, the wineries are very much, you have the winery and you have the vineyards around it and the wines being made from there. And so I came here the first time and I went out with the winemaker of Hartford at that point um, and was just amazed at how you drive to all these far out regions to get to the vineyard sites. And it blew my mind how we would go through these redwood forests and then we would go through these oak forests and it's just all these way out places and you'll end up on, a, on the top of a mountain overlooking the ocean and you know, it's. It was, a, it was a fantastic surprise to me to realize kind of the diversity in the area and, and to be able to, to see like, okay, not only am I going to go visit vineyards, but I'm, I'm gonna go do some sightseeing. You know, I th I'll throw my binoculars in and, and go find birds and stuff, you know? And, and the deep end for me was especially that way, really getting out there and getting out of the way of, of the regular Sonoma County, Mendocino County, when you, when you drive in there, the further you go, the more you realize that this is a place that's kind of remained sort of old fashioned in a way, um, you know, untouched really, other than, than the vineyards and the apple orchards um, uh, that's, that's growing there. Just, just a beautiful site. And, and so when you get to these two vineyards, by the time you reach them, you've You've gone so far that you you thought you're heading back into the redwoods. You know you're you're almost through the Anderson Valley. So just beautiful. It's just an awesome sight. I love it. Perfect. Yeah, I've uh, agreed. Yes, it's when it generally when I'm speaking to groups that maybe haven't been to Anderson Valley, I I always say this isn't this isn't Napa. It's not you know Michelin three star hotels and relay or Michelin three star restaurants relay chateau hotels. It is just. It's take a drive, take in the scenery, enjoy the moment. So thank you for, for yeah, setting that up. You definitely so, have no thoughts about, about the deep end that just grab you. Yeah, I, you know, similarly, it's, you know, living in Sonoma, I live in Healdsburg. Um, it's, it's not that far as the crow flies, but you, when you hit the valley, you know, definitely you're in a different place in a different time. Um, and the other interesting thing I always find about Anderson Valley is it's, you know, relative size. Um, it's not very long from tip to tip and it's not super wide either. And when you're in the valley, you really feel like you're in the valley. Um, when you're in the Russian River Valley, by contrast, you don't really often feel like you're in a valley. But in Anderson Valley, you, you're, you're, you're hemmed in there. Um, and so there's a, there's a certain cohesiveness, I think, to the experience of being there. Um, although, you know, when you taste wines from different parts of the valley, it's amazing how different they are in such a small area. Um, but, the, but there definitely is a cohesive feel to being in Anderson Valley. Um, and then the other thing I think with the deep end in particular is 
you know, a lot of these, a lot of these sites, you know, California is young as a wine region in general, but Anderson Valley is really pretty young. And when you explore that even further in the deep end and these two sites we're talking about, you know, I don't, people didn't think this was viable um, to grow things 30 years ago, this far up. Um, there's, um, and, you know, we talk about climate change and things and uh, um, you'll see with the, the 17 from Hartford Court was a very warm, very, very warm vintage. And yet these, these vineyards in the deep end handled it really, really well. Um, I love our 17s. And in some other places we made wine, they're, they're way more exotic, but at Kaiser Vineyard, it, it, it handled it perfectly. And then you have a vintage like 18 that's very different, uh, very cool. And we were waiting till the very last possible moment to pick and we were into October. And um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a region that has, uh, it's a very cool climate region. And I think you feel that too, especially when you're on the edges of the season. Um, you know, like right now, it can still be pretty cool there. And certainly as you start getting into late August and September, when you're there, you notice um, how short the days are. You know, you get some heat and then all of a sudden the temperature just plummets um, and it gets really, really cold at night. So right. um, I think that's another really significant factor with the deep end. It's always neat when you pull up, you know, rainfall and average weather, how much different it is in, in deep end than Boonville. Um, you know, Jensen, kind of going back a couple slides, and please don't go back, uh, Courtney, but talking about, you know, elements that help define typicity, do you find elements in deep end, whether it be the flavor aroma category, or I think especially tannin uh, and acid, do you find a difference with the wines in the deep end, or at least working with fruit down there, or up there, I guess it's. Was that for me or uh, Tia? Both of you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, one of the things that attracts me to Anderson Valley for making wine and especially Pinot Noir is um, it, it is the, the structural elements of the wine. Um, I think there's a, a certain um, a certain strength of, of texture and a certain thing that you often, you know, it's, it's, a, it's one of the things say that people would look for in Burgundy and its ability to age is this real structural element um, that oftentimes, um, you know, in California, we're getting rounder, riper, richer flavors. And lots of times in the Anderson Valley, you're finding darker, more structured flavors. And I think that's really compelling. Um, perhaps there's a little trade-off in terms of immediacy of when the wines are ready. A lot of our wines from say Sonoma Coast are, are they're more flashy, more open, more early. And some of our wines from the deep end, it's like, you know, we're aging them for 20 months and I'm still kind of like, man, if I, if I didn't need those barrels back for, for the third harvest that's gonna happen here, I might consider aging it even further because I'm just kind of waiting for it to blossom. Um, but ultimately I think that's an amazing, amazing thing that they unfold slowly. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree. Tion, yeah, you, so just to, for everyone out there, Tion makes Pinot Noir everywhere from, you know, uh, Eole Amity Hills down through Santa Rita Hills, um, and then has two sites in Anderson Valley, one in Boonville at high elevation, and then one in, uh, of course, the deep end, which we're tasting today. So would love your same perspective on that, Tion, especially if we want to relate it specifically to, you know, Muldoon Trail and, and Velvet Sisters. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, you know, talking about the deep end and our Velvet Sisters, it's, to me, it's, you know, I think, you know, Noah alluded to this as well. It's, it's this, there is always this tannin piece, but to me, it's a beautiful play between tannin and acid that's, that's giving a real elegant minerality to the wines. And, you know, tasting both these wines today, even though they're different style, they both have this, this core of tannin that's bringing weight and texture to the wines. And really then how, they, how they're showing around the edges of that is what's so interesting to me. There's, there's a prettiness and an elegance to it and the texture really varies from year to year, but in, a, but in general, it's the same feel. These wines are, they're elegant, but they're serious underneath and they're long, they just keep going on forever. And what's so fun, um, 
you know, you mentioned that we have the Muldoon Trail. So this vineyard is, the, the, the Velvet Sisters Maggie Oak Vineyard is about 300 feet elevation, whereas the um, Muldoon Trail is above Boonville, and that's at about 1,500 or so feet elevation. So big difference there. Uh, when I drive up uh, and try to escape the craziness of harvest, I, I head into the um, Muldoon Trail Vineyard first, and you know, if you're there 7.30 in the morning or eight o'clock, whatever time I happen to make it up there, it's, it's warm already. It can be 80 degrees up there. So the ripening is completely different up there. And we find this, um, you know, it's almost, there's a, there's a mountain phenolic to it. There's, there's a grip to the tannin. There's, there's a spice to it um, that, that's alive and makes you think about it. And, and, and keeps you engaged and, and gripped at the same time. And then when we're done there and you head down the valley, I mean, the temperature can change in 15 minutes. You're up there, it's 80 degrees. You head down into the valley and up to the, to the deep end and it's uh, 55 or, or 60 degrees. You know, it's, it's a huge temperature difference and it's cold and foggy and I have to dig my sweater back out and, um, you know, warm up again, but then you get then you get this, this soft and bright acidity uh, surrounded by this uh, gentle, you know, textural um, tannin that I described. So you're going from something that's muscular and powerful to something that's elegant um, and juicy at the same time. Love it. Yeah, Tonya last, Tony last week was uh, referring to the kaleidoscope that, uh, that of expression that can happen within uh, the Anderson Valley and Tian, you just explained it to us, you know, pretty, uh, pretty perfectly, yeah. So I'd, I'd like to jump in. I, it's pretty interesting, something Tian said. I think there's some, some surface impression that the wines are super different, but there's something underneath that, even though stylistically they're different, is, is very similar. And it does have to do with the, the tannins and acid and, the, and the, that signature of the wine, it's very, very similar. Love it. Okay. So just for everyone out there, just a quick review. Obviously, we've been discussing the deep end and, and the rest of the Anderson Valley for the last, you know, 10 minutes or so, uh, which has just been beautiful. Thank you, Noah and Tian. Um, just a little quick review here on the five neighborhoods. So where Tian was talking about is, is uh, this Boonville area way up on the hillside um, on the east hillside there and then where we are essentially is right where these with these two vineyards right off of 128 up by Navarro so uh, vast changes in this uh, Navarro River Valley Anderson Valley flowing northwest into the Pacific um, all right Noah I'd love to dig deeper into your hood your dirt um, the Kaiser Vineyard uh, specifically which we have in front of us you know, walk us through through the vineyard, some some of the the clones that you're using here, some things that you know, day to day you find in terms of either like flowering or harvest or kind of what makes this wine tick. Um, mm -hmm. I think all of us that have this wine in our glass right now are are happy we do. It's it's really beautiful. Um, it just it's singing. It's vibrant. It's nuanced. Um, love to hear more about this vineyard. I know there's 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 a lot to it. Yeah. Um, so the Kaiser Vineyard is about uh, 20 years old now, um, and we make three different bottlings from it. Um, the, the two key differences is there's a very distinct upper and lower section. What we have here is the lower um, section bottling. And although in general, this whole end of the valley is very cool anyway, the lower part is much cooler even than the upper part of Kaiser. And there's only maybe, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 feet of difference between the bottom of the lower and the top of the top. But it's, it's significant. Um, so significant that harvest is usually about two weeks later in the bottom than it is in the top, uh, which is pretty dramatic for a, for a vineyard that is, you know, it's not that big and um, it's in a cool region in general. And everything kind of follows that path, you know, bud break, flowering, everything's later um, in the bottom. Um, the other interesting thing about this vineyard is that um, the, there's kind of an inversion layer 
Um, so normally air gets cooler the higher up you go. Here, cold air just sinks and it sits right on the lower part of the vineyard. Um, at the top of the vineyard, you have um, very, very thin topsoil. And so you have this fractured sandstone and shale, which is very common on the, hills, the hillsides of Anderson Valley, um, but with you know very, very little topsoil. Some places there's almost no topsoil. Um, as you get to the lower block, obviously there's been some erosion over the years and um, it's not super deep um, comparatively, but it's um, deeper than the top. And I think when we compare the top and the bottom, uh, the upper and the lower blocks, um, the upper block is more red and more bright and the lower can be a little darker and more intense. And I think, I think it's partly due to the the inversion layer and the cooler temperatures, but also slightly deeper soils down there. Um, on the bottom, uh, I mentioned we make three wines. There, it's all 115 right now on the bottom, although we're we're planting a or we're ripped out and replanted one of the blocks on the bottom. Um, so we'll have a different clone there. Um, but uh, there's another block that we call the suitcase block that has some some. Uh, stuff that was brought over, uh, not in a suitcase, but similarly um, from Burgundy. Sock, you know, so we, <laughs> we, we bottle that uh, separately. Um, so really this one is only the 115 clone. Um, the, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there's, it's usually a, you know, I would say mid to late September kind of pick. Um, 18 was a very, very cool, vintage um, for us. And we literally kind of got to the end, I think it was October 3rd, perhaps, and there was a rainstorm coming the next day. And we thought, and, and the leaves were starting to fall off the, the vines. And it was kind of like, this is it, you know, this is, this is our day. Um, uh, th there is no other option. Um, and, you know, normally, I would say our style is we, we tend to make wines that are um, relatively lower in alcohol. Um, this particular wine is probably even lower than what we would normally make, and that is certainly just a factor of the vintage. Um, we get uh, very, very low yields here, so usually um, two tons per acre or less. Um, we've had a lot of one and three quarters um, average across the whole vineyard. Um, so the, the bunches tend to be very small, um, very intense. And, um, and then our winemaking for all of our Pinots kind of starts the same. We, we have all two ton fermenters. So we ferment every block um, separately. In some cases, like with this particular lower block, we end up with multiple uh, fermentations, all of 115, all from the lower clone, or all, all from the lower block. And, um, and then we'll treat each of those fermentations a little differently. So we'll do one 100% destemmed and then maybe one, you know, 20% destemmed. And, and at some vintages we'll, you know, go as high as like 50 or 60% whole cluster. Um, and uh, in 18, we, we kind of backed off the, the whole cluster only because we, it had taken so long to, uh, to get ripe. And so we didn't feel like we had a lot of extra fruit to kind of play that full cluster character off of. Um, so we backed off more than what is normal. Normally, if you look across, you know, normally, <laughs> uh, if you look across all of our lots, we're probably averaging about 20%, 20 to 30%, depending on the vintage. Uh, this, this was way backed off and we, we were only about 10% whole cluster. Um, we also do... Um, we only bottled about 100 cases of this particular wine. We, we do have more pieces. And so this is a, ends up being a barrel selection um, of kind of our favorite barrels. We use um, different coopers. We use different, different ages. So we'll gener are generally kind of like 25% new French oak. But then we have a lot of once used, twice used, neutral barrels. And at the end, it's, it's just a selection of kind of what makes the, what makes the best wine. Um, I always say it's, it's truly not often um, necessarily what all the best barrels are, but it's the barrels that work the best together. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's 
that's kind of the wine here. Um, you see alcohol, 12 and a half percent. We also find very low pHs at the bottom. Um, I, I don't think we've cracked three, four at the bottom ever, not in 17, not in 18, not in 19. Um, it's, it's just always holds on to its acid really, really well. Uh, the top, we, the upper block, the, um, we see a little bit difference. We can kind of be in the three, five, three, six range, um, but in the bottom, it just, it just doesn't happen, which I like. I like it really adds to the, the freshness and the, the edginess of the wines. Absolutely. Those are great terms. Yeah, the fresh, the freshness and the edginess. It is so incredibly pretty. It's so incredibly focused. Uh, and there's such, with the, with along with the kind of sense of delicacy that you get, there's so much kind of core power there. It's really good. And we also, yeah. another thing to think about, I think with our wines is we always um, are thinking about longevity with our wines. Um, you know, maybe they won't age 40 years, but we're always hoping they'll be better and, or maybe not better, but they will evolve gracefully in 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, and so that's one of the things we certainly think about when we're making wine is, is longevity. Well, and I think, I mean, based on your description of this lower block, certainly what's in this glass and this bottle, I think that's, that's a very achievable goal. I mean, I've had wines off of this, this vineyard, um, with at least you know ten years of age, and they're they're beautiful, and they're kind of just coming around. So yeah, and if if, if people don't know a um, little bit of the history of this vineyard, uh, Copan made this wine from the first vintage, which I believe was 04. Um, and they always made three bottlings as well, and um, they made it all the way through two thousand sixteen. And so there's a lot of great vintages. The uh, 2009. I had the 14 recently was great. Yeah, 14 was a great vintage. Um, 2009 Kaiser Lower is one of my favorite California Pinots I've ever had. So certainly nice. I feel very lucky to, to be able to, to make it now myself. We're lucky to taste it for sure. Uh, Peter, any, any closing thoughts on the Reeve, uh, you know, from a sommelier perspective? If you were, you know, you have this wine on your wine list in a restaurant and, and a guest came in and said, hey, I like Pinot, kind of how would you, how would you come to the conclusion that this would be a great bottle of wine for somebody other than that it's just a great bottle of wine? Oh, uh, well, by, by doing what we do, by asking, by asking questions. <laughs> uh, and there's, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of standard questions that you, that you kind of ask. Uh, I mean, I, I always come right out and, and not be bashful about price. Uh, I th and I tell my guests and people that care, don't be bashful about, about price. Any kind of restaurant or retail shop worth their, worth their weight will have delicious wines in different price ranges. Uh, so never ever be uh, embarrassed to you know, include that in the conversation. Uh, oftentimes a good question for me if we're kind of like, uh, I mean, you know, communication about wine as we know is so incredibly subjective. Uh, a good kind of question if I'm having maybe not really communicating uh, with people is give me some other uh, labels that you like, some other producers that you like. Uh, and that can oftentimes really kind of frame for me better what style of, of wine th they, they like. Uh, I would also recommend, I'm a huge fan of decanting wines. Uh, so I would gently decant this immediately into a nice decanter. Uh, not that it's old and needs it because of sediment, but because it's just a young, beautifully fresh uh, wine with a lot of structure. So that's a, that's a no -brainer. Sure, and if you had a four top, it's only gonna last a half hour, if that, right? Oh, so yeah. So just just that just that yes. action, and even just a couple of minutes, and then pour it into the you know the wine the, the glasses. Even that that double kind of aeration into the decanter and then into the wine glasses helps. Uh, but I would ask them about I would ask them about the you know the, the shape and the style of the of the wines that they like. Do they like Pinot Noirs that are a little uh, riper and more generous on that kind of broader you know mid palate? Uh, I would ask about their you know maybe some oak characteristics. Do they like them um, spicy and uh, baking spices and uh, vanilla, uh, or do they like them a little more uh, kind of you know lean and more kind of like uh, naked red fruits? 
uh, just questions, you know, questions like that. Also, what they're having for dinner, you know. Naked red fruits. All I right. Like uh, we're gonna, <laughs> I'm going to feel that. We're gonna, <laughs> you know, you got to, I mean, take them or leave them, sommeliers, right? Like, <laughs> the sommelier in the room. I also, uh, yeah, I, also, uh, so, I, also, I also try not to get too, I try to get too fancy with like what kind of red fruits. I just try and paint like thank broad, you. broad pictures. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's perfect. Yeah. Lean and naked. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's exposed. It's, it's vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dion, uh, let's move on to uh, perhaps a curvier shape of Pinot Noir from the deep end. Um, Velvet Sisters from the Maggie Hawk Vineyard, which is for all intents and purposes across the 128 uh, from the Kaiser. So yeah, wouldn't mind forwarding that. Yeah, I, uh, I I don't know how I'm supposed to you know continue on now <laughs> that the conversation has gone to naked red fruit. Um, but you know, it's it, that's a beautiful description, Peter. I don't think I'll ever forget to describe Anderson Valley wines as being naked and fruity. Um, but yes, you know, no, I really enjoyed, I am really enjoying your wine. It's, it's beautiful and it's, it's, it's so interesting to compare these two wines, you know, how we've kind of discussed before and how many similarities there are. And then also the, the, the aspects that make them different. But, um, as far as the Maggie Hawk's concerned, or, or the Velvet Sisters from the Maggie Hawk Vineyard, uh, it's right just across the street, and this is an undulating vineyard uh, that goes from higher up. Um, I don't know, probably she should probably range is between 300 and maybe 600 feet elevation. The portion that we get is from a block uh, also down below, one of the lowest blocks um, of the vineyard. Clone 777, similar, similar soils than what Noah was describing, um, you know, has a similar impact on, uh, on the wine here. We're drinking the 2017, and what's so cool is how extremely different the 17 and 18 vintages are, or were, um, you know, as the 18 was, was cold and long, and just, you know, great slow growing season. Uh, the 17, this was, coming out of the drought years for us um, in Northern California. Uh, we had a ton of rain over the winter and um, into spring as well, just before bloom. Uh, the soils were saturated in water and then it just got warm. And we had a really warm uh, summer and then uh, early, middle September, we had um, some heat spikes as well. So really pushed the ripening. And you can kind of see how our wine the pH is higher, the alcohol is a bit higher. So a different style of wine here because of the climate, um, that vintage, but probably because we hang our fruit a little longer as well. Just, you know, we're, we're, looking, we're looking to show a different side of what the Anderson Valley has to offer. So, you know, with the 17 vintage, you're getting this wine that's kind of showy right now. Um, it, it's, it's up front and it's showing floral, but also tea and cinnamon. And, and I like to say um, there's a little bit of pennyroyal in there. And now it's kind of, maybe this is more of a dry pennyroyal this year. It's, when you talk about the Anderson Valley wines, you just can't help but want to describe these wines with having some pennyroyal because you can almost smell it in the valley. It's just such an Anderson Valley thing and it's beautiful. Um, so, you know, different, Varying degrees of of, of uh, penny royal is always is always present, but um, you know as far as the making is concerned, for this very similar to to how Noah does it, we try to keep you know portions. When this block the seven 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 came in, we were keeping a, you know a few tons separate so that we can do some experimentation with some whole cluster. Mm -hmm. We like to see what the whole cluster does every year. And then kind of when we start putting blends together, we can uh, decide whether it's actually contributing to the mouthfeel uh, to the extent that it's showing what Maggie Hawk veneer should show 
or is it taking something away and then we actually won't add it? So it really depends on the vintage, um, you know, how much of that we would actually end up blending in. And um, this, this vintage actually, since it was so hot, we did probably end up putting a little bit in. I would say that the, the whole cluster percentage is, you know, no more than four or 5%. So really, really light uh, in there. I, I don't think you can really even pick any of that up, but that's the point, you know, when we're doing, when we're doing anything, when we're making the wines, it's to, it's to kind of showcase and lift what's present and not bring any aspects in that's going to stand out on its, on its own. And, um, so that's the same for us when we're when we're processing the grapes here too. So it's handpicked, comes into the winery, it's sorted, goes into small open top fermenters. Uh, it's a native fermentation, takes two to three weeks to finish, and uh, then we will um, separate the wine out from the skins and go to barrel. And the malolactic fermentation is is native at that point as well. It's all French oak, um, so really. A pretty hands-off approach. You could say it's because we want to just really let the grapes show uh, what's going on and what it is. But others would say that we're just lazy winemakers at Hartford. It, you know, whatever, whatever you want to pick, it, it could be. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> Peter, it's Tom Rosner who says that. He says we're lazy. <laughs> no, I love Tom Rosner. Just kidding. Um, so, we, you know, we put the wine in barrel and they'll stay in barrel there until we make the blend, which is about 10 months later. Sorry about the noise in the background. Um, 10 months later, we'll make the blend. We'll put them back to barrel uh, for a further seven months so they can just kind of mellow out. You know how Noah was saying too, you, you, you need to let these wines sit in barrel and just chill so they can really come together so that that acid and that tannin um, can, can integrate really into the wine. And you know that that made me think of this 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 group that uh, Courtney was mentioning earlier on. The I think we're called the uh, Anderson Valley Terroirists. I think that's what it is, which I think is pretty cool. It's a group of a bunch of winemakers um, up there, and we're you know I, I'm I'm not from up there. I, I visit every now and again. I try to get up there when I can, but there's a true community there. I think it's fantastic. And these, this group of winemakers are, are trying to figure this area out. You know, the Anderson Valley is small, uh, but it's complex and it has a lot going on. And you have Valley floor and you have West ridges and you have East ridges and you have so many different things going on. So we're all trying to taste each other's wines from all these different regions to see like, is there a thread here? And is there really true differences from these, from these, sections or areas within the valley and it's it's so fantastic to see the smaller differences but truly we're finding the acid is in all of these wines and we're finding the structure and the texture and the prettiness is in all of these wines it's it's and i must say i've really learned i've learned a lot about the people and the wines up in the valley over the last few years being part of this and I don't know if they know this or not, but their wines are, they're getting better. And I think it's a great, it's a great thing that they're, they're, they're hanging out together. I mean, the last meeting we were at, they were yelling at each other, but it was out of love and passion for this. You know, I thought it was fantastic. I was sitting back drinking a beer, just kind of listening and I, they were going at it and it was great, you know, and, and they're going to help each other make these wines better. We just need to, we just need to help get these wines out and have people taste Anderson Valley wines and understand that this is, a, this is a fun and unique and a fantastic site. And there's a lot to learn here. Yeah. Sorry, I- uh, I No, T I on that was- on there. That was, that no, was, awesome. That was cash money. I, I love listening to winemakers, winemakers talk. You know, a couple of years ago, I mentioned the, 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 the Pinot Noir Festival that I put together. Uh, a couple of years ago, a friend was walking around the rooms and it was all California and Oregon. So it was all West Coast. We had about 50 producers. Uh, and it was just a three hour walk around celebration. Uh, and a friend of mine was walking around the room saying, wow, there's a lot of Anderson Valley Pinot Noir represented here by, by wineries from outside the region. So there's obviously a humongous interest for what Anderson Valley fruit uh, has to offer. Indeed. So uh, without further ado, uh, drum roll please. Let's move into the survey results. So this is 
you all, uh, I think there were around 18 of you responding to your impressions of the wines and, and the, that brutal questionnaire we asked of you. Uh, again, the general idea is here, can we as a group come up with some sort of thing to define uh, deep end or at least glean a little insight into typicity of this area? And, and I think our winemakers kind of weaved in some some value or some some very important information along the way as well. So, okay. So, all right, here we go. <clears throat> With regards to color, and again, I mean, does color define typicity? Ah, I don't know. Maybe again, it could be um, could be climate, could be winemaking, all the above, but. Um, not a lot of purple in either of these, which would which would lean us, you know, in in my head towards warmer climate, maybe more cold soaking, that sort of thing. Um, let's move to the the next one, please. Okay, color intensity. This is a good one, um, Noah. What do you think? Uh, I, I think this is this is this is spot on for you. Spot on, yeah. Between the two myself. Yeah, I think, you know, I think I said medium. I probably would have, if there was something in between those two, I might have picked that. Uh, it's kind of laughed. It's interesting. Both the graphics you popped up, they're like very different proportions and colors. So, um, but yeah, I, th I think definitely right. spot on for our wine. And Tion, do you think some of your darker colors? is more just when you harvest, is it winemaking? Is it the vintage or clones? I mean, it's, it's all 777, right? I mean, does that matter in terms of the color? Ours is all 777. I don't think that that necessarily matters in this case. I think uh, vintage has something to do with it. And the fact that our ripeness is a little bit more intense here. Sure. Um, the alcohol is a good uh, solvent. It will help. Uh, bring out more tan and more color out of the skins uh, as well. Yeah. Cool. All right. We all just learned something. <laughs> Thank you, Tion. Um, okay. So aromas and flavors, this is what I want to see. It's everything. Um, but let's look at some things that scored very high on both. Uh, fresh red fruits yeah. scored very high on both. So could we say, all right, deep end, there is an underlying freshness, even though we had a warm vintage and generally a producer that harvests maybe a touch later than the other, there's freshness, great. Um, some jammy on, which makes sense, I guess. Uh, anybody else, what, do you, what are you seeing in terms of some similarities that may not have to do with winemaking or vintage? Uh, and I'll lean on you, Peter, or the winemakers. Any thoughts? I, I think savory, umami, earthy, to see both of those um, pop up, I think shows a bit of typicity. Yes, spice is pretty high on both as well. And I definitely, that resonates with me quite a bit. Cool. I love the, I love the difference. I think you just mentioned it, uh, the different uh, kind of fruit expression uh, profile uh, mm -hmm. between, uh, was the the jammy or, or dried red fruits uh, for the uh, the Reeve Kaiser uh, versus the uh, versus the Hartford Velvet Sisters? Once again, alluding to that kind of uh, almost like baked in baked in a pie in a very very good way uh, okay. expression of fruit. It's also interesting the the difference between uh, fresh herb and dried herb. Our fresh herb on the Reeve is pretty high. Our dried herb is very low, and then exactly the opposite oh, on the. Uh -huh. It, yeah, yeah. I wonder if that's vintage related. That's interesting. What I like to, that is that you know we put citrus on there, the blood orange and so on. And often when when people are describing red wines, it, it, citrus isn't necessarily something you find. Um, but for the Anderson Valley and actually for the Russian River Valley too, it, it we do find it. And I'm and I'm glad to see that that people actually did find the citrus in there because it's really fun to find the citrus fruit, but you also can find like the pith and you can find the peel, you know, the oiliness in the peel. There's there's all those different aspects, which is neat. Yeah, I alluded to it earlier, but if I had like a, a, mar a marker, 
uh, that kind of leads me toward Anderson Valley. It's that kind of orange peel or blood orange uh, yeah. character in the, in the Pinot Noir. I don't find it all the time, but when I find it, I'm like, hmm, that reminds me of Anderson Valley. Right. Uh, I'm coming back to this, this, uh, the results there. This is, this is awesome. Who crushed rock? Well, that's a great comment. I like that. Black like licorice is interesting too. Yeah, those are like, those are great kind of leading in towards the, that, that mouthfeel, connecting mouthfeel and flavor, right? The tan and acid all playing together. I love that. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> I think as one could expect, uh, the body answers here were quite a bit different. So, I, I mean, I don't know if we're going to define typicity uh, based on body of these two wines uh, and the vintages, but in general, we're looking at this sort of medium um, and then depending on vintage and producer leaning towards a little lighter or maybe towards a little heavier, but nothing extreme on either side. I think makes sense. What do you yeah. guys think? I think that's a really good evalu evaluation. Yeah. Cool. It, it would have been interesting if we would have had our 17. We've, we've been yeah. sold out for a long time of our 17, but uh, honestly, our 17 was, was way more similar, even though stylistically we're, we're still different. You know, the, the 17 Kaiser was more similar to the, to the 17 Velvet Sisters. Like that would, it would, that would make sense, yeah. Fascinating comparison. Our, you know, our alcohol levels were pit pushing 14 and 17, which is, you know, relatively high for us. Um, color was more, everything showed up more. So, uh, interesting. Groovy. All right. So this was, I mean, and again, all of these are, based on the world of Pinot Noir and, you know, we expect some level of elevated acidity, but a um, lot of strong mediums on the Hartford. And, you know, again, I think a lot of this just kind of goes back to producer style and vintage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's interesting to note how there's a, there's a thread in the Reeve and then the thread in the Hartford as, as you connect the dots between acidity and body and the fruit and the fresh herb, like this is the wine you have here. And this is, you know, when you want to talk about typicity, that's, that's, there's, there's typicity there for that vintage from the deep end of the Anderson Valley versus the thread that we saw in the velvet, we see in the velvet sisters, um, you know, for body and for, 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 acidity and color and so on for the 17 vintage. Yeah, that's, that's really fun. It's kind of a great way to line them up and compare them. And it also kind of shows, I mean, obviously certain things are weighted, but I mean, looking at the Reeve, everywhere from low plus to high, uh, with the exception of medium plus kind of got, I feel like I'm playing, uh, what is it, that Trivial Pursuits where you've got the little, yes. and you fill them out. Um, on the one on the left, it's just interesting, like all of our perception and what yeah. we see yeah. as tasters. You know, who knows? Maybe where some people are tasting, it's raining, or you know how things are showing. Maybe they, you know, they didn't have lunch, or it's just interesting. That, that is really interesting. Yeah, cool. I, de I definitely get just talking about the, the the acid expression in the in the two wines. I definitely get a kind of a similar. Uh, a similar core beam of of, uh, of of similar of similar acid, even though the Hartford seems to be, you know, vintage wise and winemaking wise, decked out in a little more flesh uh, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, you know broadness and, and body and richness. I still find in there that really kind of fine core of uh, of, of red fruit acidity that 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 I find in the in the Reeve as well. This one's cool. And I think this goes back to the aroma flavor question about spice. Because I mean, it's obviously between the two, the one that's standing out other than there, there were no perceived oak notes on the Reeve. 
um, spice and, and how, you know, are we perceiving that as an oak spice or just spice in general? And so again, drawing lines, is there a underlying spice character, whether it be oak or not in the deep end? Yeah. I mean, I, def I definitely think the wines of the Anderson Valley, you know, tend to show some spice. And I, I think in the, in the context of the whole flavor of the wine, one of the things I love about it is sometimes the spice slash other notes, other than fruit notes, tend to, tend to make a first impression that is equal to or sometimes greater than the fruit. Um, even in wines that have a lot of fruit, it's like that element, um, you know, I'll call it kind of this structural, spicy, earthy element, like definitely holds its own against the fruit almost all the time in Anderson Valley wines. That's an interesting comment when we're talking about regional typicity, because I can, I can, you know, think of some other AVAs, you know, around the world and in California that do show more of that fruit expression uh, up front. Uh, okay. Whereas, it, like you say, Anderson, Anderson Valley, uh, kind of like, you know, side by side or equal or uh, they express uh, at the same time. Yeah. I also think just, you know, we could talk for two more hours on oak, but I think, you know, looking back at the, the Hartford slide, I think in terms of new oak, there's actually a similar amount of oak used. Yeah. I think it's both, you know, probably the Coopers that we're using and the vintage combining to kind of create one impression or the other, but it's, uh, you know, we, we tend to use barrels that are kind of like medium to lower toast. Um, and so I, you know, it's, it's just, you know, well, like I said earlier, it's pretty much just a stylistic thing. And I like underneath a couple of things between vintage and, and Cooperage, I can, I can taste very, very similar wines. So uh, Noah, real quick before, uh, there was a really great question um, from Bryce a few minutes ago. Is there a reason this is labeled as Mendocino County rather than Anderson Valley? Um, That's pretty interesting. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> you're like, I actually picked up the bottle. Me. I'm like, is it? Um, there is no reason. Um, okay. <laughs> I think um, I think it's probably something to do. I'm embarrassed to say this, but with our how all of our uh, our label formatting works for our other regions, and so um, I, I know you know in Sonoma County you have to say Sonoma County on the label mm -hmm. by law even if it's Russian River or Anderson Valley. And so, <laughs> honestly, I think it's sort of a relic of, uh, of that label requirement in Sonoma County. And our label designer probably just put that on there because it has to be there for Sonoma County. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so uh, last but not least, uh, hopefully you all had a little fun with this one, especially as it came to the double-double um, question uh, some people apparently don't live on the West Coast, so <laughs> they don't know the double double. Uh, but yeah, kind of fun, right? These are these are some classic kind of pairings with with Pinot Noir, and I think especially wines like this that have some depth of fruit, um, but also have great structure and earthy components. You can have everything from you know really decadent sort of swanky things like Moro mushroom risotto. Again, think of being in a and foraging, you know, Anderson Valley, as you can see by our, well, where we're sitting right now, uh, it's a forest. So I think a lot of those things really make sense. And then other more just kind of fun foods that we, we eat uh, from the day to day. You know, what I, I, what I think is interesting <laughs> is to look at the, that olive green one that says all of you. And so obviously the Reeve folks they would like to hang out with a bunch of people and drink this in the, in the Hartford I don't know is that is, is, you're anti-socials or you just want to have the whole bottle to yourself what's the deal there <laughs> I think I think maybe they like Noah's background better uh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. that is Tion that's the observation of the day uh if we're giving away prizes you win that one <laughs> I, lo I love the uh I, I take that personally 
<laughs> one, one, of, one of my one of my favorite uh, matches can be uh, duck duck and Pinot Noir, depending on the style. And I like that little edge of the uh, the Hartford uh, with the duck breast with cherry compote over the uh, uh, just over the the Reeve. Uh, that 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 pairing with the addition of the you know the sweeter fruit, uh, the fatty duck breast. Obviously, both of those are just slam dunk Pinot Noir pairings. I mean. My mouth is watering, just kind of looking at the results here. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting to me is I, I, often people drink wines and then describe wines in a certain way. And some wines are described as have this wine whenever, whatever, and have this, this is a food wine. This wine is like, you know, this is going to pair so well. And the food is going to bring nuances out in the wine and the wine is going to bring out nuances in the food. And how all the all the graphs are higher in the reef it's it, it's fun that's to me is a food wine that's how i would have described it as well it's a it's a wine whose complexity and acidity matches well with food um and obviously a bunch of people <laughs> <laughs> i love it fun graphs yeah yeah that worked, that worked out really well Great. Well, thank, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone out there for participating, those of you that had the wines. Hopefully that was a kind of a neat exercise for you all. I think it was, you know, it's amazing whenever we do that, how much information we all learn. Uh, those of us on a panel, you know, whether it be just in terms of how people are perceiving the wines or, yeah, yeah, there's there's some common thread stuff here. So um, any any questions out there? I, I, there were a few. I think we... We answered most of them. Uh, yeah, there, 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 was a question about, there was a question about a, a switch in clonal material uh, for the Reeve in two vintages. It said, yeah, I think that was a little bit, uh, the upper block is uh, 667, 777, and 114. The lower block has always just been 114. Yeah, I got you. Okay, yeah. yeah. Great. I'm looking forward to, um, going upstairs and watching the Warriors game and drinking the rest of this Hartford. <laughs> it's, it's, su it's such a pleasure. We've obviously got two incredibly beautiful expressions here of the deep end. Uh, I'm, th I'm, th I'm, th I'm thinking I'd like to throw this out as, as well, gentlemen and ladies and who's ever, ever watching. We've got, we've got Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers in our, in our, in our, in our glasses, the Reeve, a uh, little Fred Astaire. Uh, the Hartford, a little more kind of voluptuous, a little more in a, in, a, in, a, in a beautiful dress, but both beautifully athletic on their feet and sprightly and dancing and just really, really both beautiful wines. Thank you. I like your comparisons. I think I just have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no one's gonna watch the, the, the basketball game. <laughs> Jan, you should get your butt up to date and watch some old, uh, some old 1940s movies. <laughs> Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Uh, okay, that's it. I was wondering. I mean, you know, Peter was watching those in high school, so <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Um, no, straight up though, the, these wines were great. Uh, Jan, thank you so much. Noah, thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much. And then the scenes. I'd also like to thank, uh, of course, Courtney from Anderson Valley Wine Growers Association and Nick Martinell, um, who really helped, you know, kind of keep everything moving forward. And then one other person behind the scenes, Gillian Handelman, a colleague of mine who's really been instrumental in moving the uh, Anderson Valley Wine Growers Association and just <coughs> love for the place. Um, she's always a rock and brilliant and hilarious. Um, thank you so much, Gillian. And yeah, that's, I, I think that, I think that we had a, a great hour. I think we, we could got, go on another hour. Absolutely. But also yeah. talk about the deep end. And I, I think for me, Tion and Noah, hearing you talk about, you know, just what it's like being there, because you can talk about climate and numbers and all this and that, but once you're there, I think you really get a better sense, right? Oh, geez, I need to put a jacket on or, you know, those sorts of things give you a great perception of where you are. And, you know, those, those things come through in these wines. And um, it was, it's been an honor to be part of this. I love uh, Anderson Valley and, and 
all the amazing winemakers and, and wine growers up there. And yeah, and that said, Nick, I look forward to hopefully next year, us all being up there together in person, uh, back doing it live. Yes, sir. We're celebrating the Anderson Valley. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. Agreed. Yes. Anderson Valley is one of the most underrated great wine regions in the world. May maybe the most. Totally, totally agree, yeah. So we look forward right. to seeing everyone there next year or this year, maybe. Hey, and thank you, thank you, Nick, for orchestrating this and moderating it and keep it keeping it flowing. And it was a uh, job well done. Thank you, sir. Thanks, guys. Pleasure. Thank you. Everyone. I'm gonna go drink this uh, Velvet Sisters by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Did they lock you in? Cheers, y'all. <laughs> Have a great day. Cheers, everyone. Hey, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.